Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, where here on this channel we talk about the Beatles all the time, and we welcome all kinds of special guests here. And this time we have Tom Brennan with us. Tom is a Bad Finger fan extraordinaire. He has a website, which is called badfingerlibrary.com, and he's been involved with a lot of projects through the years uh, of Bad Finger and Pete Ham releases, including the most recent one, which is called Gwent Gardens, which just a few months ago came out on CD for the first time, was first released digitally and for streaming, and now it's available on CD. And we're going to talk about uh, this new release, which is all Pete Ham demos, Pretty much just Pete playing everything on most of the tracks. And uh, we'll talk about that. And at some point in the future, we're going to do a show with a lot of bad finger and Beatle connections. But uh, Tom, welcome to Ken Michaels Radio. Uh, it's great to be with you finally, Ken, after so many delays. <laughs> yeah, well, and we've had lots of conversations through the years about bad finger and about some of the releases that you've been involved with. But um I want to start the conversation by letting the folks know how you became involved with a lot of these recent releases. Now, there's another uh, CD of Pete Ham demos. There have been some live Badfinger uh, releases. How did you become involved with all that? Well, I've, I've been involved with helping Dan Matavina for 25 years uh, since his um, book came out and since his first couple of Pete Ham releases came out, Seven Park Avenue and Golders Green. So at the time, back in 1998, I started a website, the Badfinger Library website, um, because you know I wanted to learn more about the group. And Dan um, gave me some feedback on my website. He would give me corrections and help me with the website. So over time, um, I developed like a trust with him. He trusted me. Um, and then, you know, over the years, I just helped him out with different projects, giving him my feedback. And, hmm. and uh, with the website, I started my own research on Badfinger concerts. Um, his book had an appendix in the back with a lot of listings. And I just took that further and did my own research and, I'm still doing that to this day. Um, it's kind of slowed down a bit, but um, that's how it started. And then eventually um, things progressed and it got to the point now where where um, Dan's no longer with us. So he he entrusted me with, with all the archives of the Badfinger and uh, the uh, Pete Ham demos and the solo demos. So he wanted me to continue um, getting them out to the public because um, he felt bad that he, he couldn't get them all out himself. And he always uh, told me that uh, before he did any update to his book, he wanted to make sure all the music got out first before um, doing a third edition of his Without You book. Okay. So Dan, did Dan have a lot of contact with the Pete Ham estate? Yeah, he was he was the uh, the agent for the Pete Ham estate for all that time for since the nineties. And were they eager to get all this stuff out? Um, I don't know, eager. Um, Dan was enthusiastic because um, Pete Ham's brother John Ham. Uh, left all the, the demo recordings to Dan, and Dan was uh, very excited to get everything out. Um, he wanted everything to be preserved. He didn't want it to be lost. Mm -hmm. He didn't want people to be able to hear it all, because uh, Pete Ham is just a brilliant artist, such a great songwriter and singer and guitarist. And it, it would be a shame for all that to be lost. Um, I, I, if Dan hadn't rescued all that all that material it would have gotten it, it would have ended up in a garbage dump it never would have been heard by anybody do you know if everything that Pete wrote was recorded and do you, do you know if his brother was aware of it how close no. were they? 
Uh, he was very close with his brother. Um, but n not everything he wrote was recorded. There are a lot of notebooks Pete had with lyrics hmm. where there are no recordings were ever made. Uh, he kept different notebooks and sheets of paper. And, and uh, his brother had, had those. And his girlfriend, Beverly, had some uh, notebooks also. So eventually um, she shared those with Dan. Now, how many songs would you say Pete wrote in his very short lifetime? Uh, when I was going through all the material that Dan left me, uh, I came out to about 250. So it might be as many as 300 because there's some that we haven't found. Some things got lost. So uh, it, between at least 250, maybe as many as 300 songs he wrote. But a lot of them were fragments and song ideas that were never finished. Right. So they're not all complete songs. A few of the songs on on uh, the new album are not finished, but they're near finished, kind of. You yeah, know? most most of the ones on this album are pretty pretty complete. Um, on future releases, there'll be more uh, songs that are thirty second fragments, but they're still interesting and catchy tunes that they're still worth hearing. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm gonna release the best of those. There's some that are. The lyrics are not finished. Uh, I'm not going to put those out. There's no point in people hearing those. They're just uh, him humming a tune, trying to figure out lyrics to a tune that he's trying to come up with. Right. Now, do you know, um, first of all, what's the story behind the record label, which is Y&T Music? Y&T, then... that's Rich Uloa. Uh -huh. Um He's a big Beatles fan and a big Badfinger fan. Uh -huh. um, that was named after, he named that company after Yesterday and Today. That's what the Y&T is. Okay. And, uh, but he, he was really excited. He did that uh, double CD album recently, Shine On. Mm. And uh, That's when, a, we went to, a when we went to do the Gwent Gardens release, um, we were only planning on doing a streaming release because there was there was no money to produce a CD, and he he noticed there was such a great demand by the fans um, reacting to our streaming release that he volunteered to uh, do CDs for us and help us out. And uh, so far, it's worked out pretty good. Um, we're going to continue working with him in the future. Okay, but all the previous releases were all limited quantities, right? Yeah, they're all limited quantities between 500 and 1,000 copies. Mm. Um, this recent one um, ended up being almost 1,500 copies. There was such a great demand. <laughs> the label, could, Rich and the label, they couldn't keep up with the demand. He had to keep replenishing the supply constantly. and it It was hard to keep it in stock at Amazon until only... Um, a few days or a few of uh, the last few weeks, there's just so many people wanted the CD and you're especially talking about, talking about Gwent Gardens, Gwent Gardens. Yeah. Especially in Japan, there's a, a big following for Badfinger Pete Ham in Japan. Um, they're only second to uh, America for Pete Ham uh, support and, you know, the number of people buying CDs and the music. Hmm. Now, how far back do you go with being a Badfinger fan? I mean, not being aware of your age. Oh, where oh. you did you follow them as soon as they came out with, uh, you know, come and get it and day after day. That's the first one I, I I've been following them since day after day. It was on the radio. Um, I followed that on WABC that year. I still have my my top one hundred list of the year from WABC. I have the original list. Yeah. I, I followed that at the end of every every year. I would I would listen to the radio and write down the the list of songs and uh, try try to get the the, the full list. But um, yeah. 1972 is the one year where I had the list. Um, I I asked I sent um, I forget what it was. I guess I sent in a, re a request and they mailed me the list or something. I I don't remember, but. 
that's the only year I have for some reason. That was my favorite year of music in the 70s. And Day After Day was on the top 100 that year. So Baby Blue um, was also on the list that year. Uh, I don't have that many memories of Baby Blue. Um, day After Day, definitely. I've heard, I remember hearing that a lot on the radio. But I don't know. For some reason, I don't remember hearing Baby Blue. But I, I know I probably heard it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so did you hear No Matter What before? Uh, uh, no, I have no memory of that. I was yeah. I was much younger, so yeah, I don't remember hearing that at all. So your first Bad Finger album would have been straight up? Or did you just buy uh, the singles? Uh, no, um, I didn't start collecting until the late, late 70s when Airwaves came out, when Tommy and Joey reunited. That's when I really started buying records. Hmm. Um, and then... Then I went back and bought the the Apple albums after that because by that time, Apple had shut down and you could buy every Badfinger album on Apple for a few dollars, mm -hmm. except for Straight Up. Straight Up was the only one that you couldn't find in the cutout bins. But Magic Christie Music, No Dice and Ass, there were dozens of copies in the stores, just very cheap, $1.99 or I forget the prices, but somewhere around a dollar ninety nine. Mm. I only remember finding Badfinger albums in used record bins, so you know, I wouldn't mind buying those in most cases. But I didn't see them in the cutouts. But you were lucky. <laughs> I found them in like the local, you know, retail store or Corvettes or you know, yeah. those kind of stores. Grants, I think I used to go to. That was one store we had, and. You know, Cal and then later Caldor Bradley's. Right. You know, yeah, we had, that was much later. I had Corvettes too and Alexander's, you know, and local record stores too. But at some point when I really was interested in the Apple recording artists, I would go to local record stores that had used records and look for them there. Um, and then at Beetlefest, <laughs> try to find those. So, you know, unless it was a really good record chain, like Record World or Sam Goody's or one of those that might have a Badfinger album, that's where I would probably hunt those down. Yeah, I might have might have gotten straight up at one of Charles Rosney's conventions. That might have been where I started getting the the harder to find records. Right now. You said that Pete wrote roughly 250, somewhere from 250 to maybe 300 songs. Have you actually heard all of them? Uh, gone through all, yeah, I've heard all the ones that we, we could uh, find in Dan's files. Yeah. Okay. And how much of them would you say is really worthwhile to listen to? Uh, from the hardcore fan that wants to hear everything. Uh, quite a bit. Um, I would say 75, 80%. Um, but um, there's still some alternate takes. I haven't haven't played all the alternate takes of some of the demos. I went through and I picked out the best uh, versions of all of them. Some have alternate takes that might also come out. Um, like, for example, I Miss You. Hmm. I discovered that he did a uh, he not only did the demo that's on Gwent Gardens, but later on, when they were planning on doing it on the first Warner Brothers album, I, to my surprise, I found another version of him doing the demo again uh, as, as a preparation for doing the Warner's album. Mm. So he actually did a, re a remake of the I Miss You demo in 1973. Okay. And, yeah. and there's also an Ivy's version of that also, which which will come out eventually. We should so. point out that on Gwent Gardens, there are 18 tracks. And of the 18, four of them are songs that eventually were released by Badfinger. And we've got I Miss You on there, Bloodwin, um, also Take It All, and Walk Out in the Rain. So how did you go through this whole process of compiling all these songs when you've got so many to pick from? How did you know it would be these songs? Did you feel these would be the best of what's unreleased at this point? Well, I started by 
making a big list of everything. And then I went through all, I listened to all the recordings and I separated them by instrument. So I made a separate list of Pete on piano, Pete on acoustic guitar, Pete on other instruments, electric guitar or, or different keyboards. So I separated them by, in, by instrument type, um, how he wrote them. And then, um, so I actually mapped out all the potential releases all at the same time. So I thought that was easier. And then I would just shuffle things around. Um, I originally, I was going to do an album of all piano tunes, but I thought that would be kind of, kind of boring to listen to. Hmm. But I did put together a, a list of an album for acoustic. So I thought of maybe doing a Pete Ham acoustic album, just uh, much like John Lennon put out, uh, the John Lennon estate put out. So uh, I'm planning on doing that as the next release. So once I separated the acoustic songs into, into an album, um, the rest of the tracks, I just split into two different albums. So Gwent Gardens was one, and then there's going to be another album later, other tunes. Um, I tried to make it, you know, interesting, um, you know, even out the tracks, not, not put all the gems all in one album and try to give you, give people a variety of, different type of songs um, on each album. And um, and then, you know, trial and error, keep listening and evaluating, reevaluating, and then moving songs around where they would sound good. And mm -hmm. um, it's uh, not Dan Successor helped me out a lot with the track listings. He's <laughs> really good at sequencing. So I let him do the sequencing. Okay. Now, before Dan passed away, was the whole set list already finished? No, no, there was nothing. Really? Uh, Dan had started a Gwent Gardens album, but he only had about three songs ready or prepared. Um, he was trying to do overdubs like he did on the, you know, the, uh, the older albums, drums and bass and other guitar parts and keyboard parts. Um, but um, it didn't get very far. Um, and he scrapped it. So, but I, I just took I just took the general idea, the concept that he had with the cover, and I I went back to the original uh, photo he had, and I redid the cover artwork. Mm -hmm. um, originally, he had a, a, a love spoon, Blodwin love spoon in the corner of the artwork, and I, it didn't look right to me. So I, I I took that out of the cover design. I didn't like that idea, so I just Are redid the cover. Yeah. Um, are you aware of if any of these songs were presented to Badfinger and turned down by the group? I mean, when I listen, and and we'll talk at length about it, when I listen to these 18 songs, so many of them are strong enough that they could have been done by the band. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you're going to hear this stuff and say, why wasn't this released or why didn't they work on it? Yeah, not, none of them. There's no no record of any of them. The only one that I, I know of is on Seven Park Avenue. There's a song called Copper Tone Blues. And I think there's an instrumental backing track that Badfinger tried to do on the Ass album. Mm -hmm. It's only instrumental, and they totally changed the arrangement of it. It's faster, and you won't even you couldn't even you won't even wouldn't even recognize what song it was. Um, huh, but. And, Know of any cases where any of these songs were presented to Badfinger, or even going back to the Ivies, because you have a lot of really early stuff here. Yeah, there's no, no record of any of that. No, it's no documentation on any of those songs. Uh, the only, the only ones to know about the Ivies are ones that got um, pressed on antiacetate uh, discs um, back in the you know '68 and '69. Those are the only ones we know of. And uh, Mal Evans, when he passed away, there was uh, an auction of his acetate collection, and a lot of those Ivy's tracks um, got sold um, that Mal had possession of. Mm -hmm. But they're all test pressings. You've been in contact with Ron Griffiths. Could he shed any light on any of these recordings? I know he's on one of them, but yeah. as to whether or not, I mean, if I was Pete Hammond, I had these songs in my pocket, I would be 
<laughs> I'd be telling the other guys in the band about them and and playing it for him. Was yeah. he helping in telling you anything about any of these songs? Um, I'd have to ask him each specific title, but like when I asked him about the Happy Song, he remembered about him. He remembered playing the bass on on there because um, he uh, he had to borrow bass guitar from uh, Lewis Collins, Bill Collins' son, uh -huh. to play on the demo for with Pete. So that's the one I asked him about because I knew he played on it. The other ones, um, I don't know. Pete Pete often recorded by himself, so Ron probably wouldn't have any memory of most of them unless you know <laughs> there was a reason for him to remember hear, hearing it, or or if Pete played it to him or something. But I'd have to ask him a, a particular song, right? Um, but uh, yeah, Pete most of the time recorded by himself. Over, you know, he stayed up all night recording. You know, you and I have talked through the years and, and I've I've mentioned to you how there are certain bands that are really fascinating to study if they happen to have more than one lead vocalist or more than one songwriter in Badfinger and certainly the Badfinger that we know best is Badfinger with Pete and Tommy and Joey and Mike. You had several. They all wrote songs. They all wrote material. So. Would you be able to tell me, do you know, was it a very competitive environment within Badfinger for each member to get their songs heard? I know Mike wrote the least. He still co-wrote with the others. But, you know, certainly by the time in the Apple years when the Ass album was done, that's half those songs are Joey Molland. But you've got great songwriters in, in the group between Pete and Tommy and Joey and to a lesser extent, Mike, was there competition to get each guy's songs on there? And they also collaborated together, too. So, yeah. But the only competition I'm aware of is between Pete and Joey. I know Joey was competing for songs on the album um, with in the Bad Finger years, like, you know, after Straight Up, it started getting more competitive with Ass and the Warners album. But as far as the Ivies, um, I'm discovering that Mike Gibbons wrote a lot more songs than I, I ever realized. Um, I found quite a, quite a lot of demos by Mike Gibbons. Um, people are going to be really surprised. He wrote a lot of songs on piano and guitar. And uh, the, the best of those will come out. Um, a lot of them are not good. Uh, maybe half of them, half of them are listenable, I would say. Um, uh but Pete, as far as competition during the Ivies, uh, Pete was the main songwriter. Ron uh, only wrote uh, maybe about a dozen songs. Um, I managed to track down all the songs he wrote. Mm -hmm. And um, Tommy is another good writer. There was not competition. They were just friendly with each other they would help each other out pete most of the time would um help the other guys he was excited when the other guys wrote their own songs he got really enthusiastic and, and wanted to help them with their demos so he would play on their demos or help them writing right um and tommy was already writing when his when he was with the calder stones his group from liverpool he already he had already started writing in the mid 60s with them uh, not a lot, but he got started with them. And then by the time the Ivies found him, he was writing a lot in the, in the late sixties. And then later on, Tommy, his songwriting slowed down a lot. Once the, um, once the band was playing on the road a lot and all the, all the stress and the pressures got to him and um, his songwriting slowed down quite a bit until uh, Badfinger uh, was was over, and then he got back into the he get he joined the Dodgers, and then got back together with Joey. He started writing more again, mm -hmm. and then eventually he was writing with Rod Roach uh, a lot of songs um, in the in the early eighties. I know I talked to you privately about this because um, 
when Ken Womack's book came out recently on Mal Evans, which is an amazing book, there's stuff in there about Badfinger that I, I wasn't aware of, not being, you know, fully educated on their history and all, but the problems that Bill Collins had with Mal Evans and feeling a sense of, I don't know, jealousy of Mal's importance in bringing the band to Apple and everything. Were you aware of all this? And is there anything that you can expand on that? Because it led to Mal no longer working for Badfinger. Yeah, in the beginning, um, Bill and Mal were very close. Um, but I guess over time, um, um, Mal got so close to them that Bill got jealous. And um, in 1970, that's when everything happened. Everything changed as far as their relationship. Um, and Alan Klein got involved with them. He got in between them and <laughs> things things got said, you know, behind others' backs and Alan Klein was, uh, he, Jeff Emmerich also was, was involved with that. Hmm. Um, originally Alan Klein didn't want Jeff Emmerich to produce the band, but then he changed his mind once Bill Collins, um, didn't like, didn't want Mal Evans around anymore. So Mal was the producer of No Dice, and then, and then, Alan Klein changed his mind. I guess uh, Bill Collins got in his ear and convinced him to hire Jeff Emmerich, because Alan Klein didn't originally like Jeff Emmerich as a producer, but because of what happened with Bill Collins and Mal Evans, Mal got pushed out, and Jeff Emmerich got brought in as producer of Badfinger. Do you know how the band felt about Mal Evans producing them? I know I spoke to Joey about it and he said he loved what Mal did because it was more their, their real sound. They, they loved Mal. Um, when the Ivy started with Apple records, um, originally Tony Visconti and um, he was their producer and um, they didn't care for Tony that much <clears throat> for some reason. Um, they didn't like, the, the direction that Tony was taking them in with their productions. And um, they you kept, know, you know, what specifically? Um, maybe the type of material it was maybe too soft or I, I'm not sure. But um, I thought I heard that um, they weren't happy with the production on, on the song, maybe tomorrow with all the strings and everything. Is there any truth to that? Maybe because if you listen to the BBC version of Maybe Tomorrow, it's it's uh, more psychedelic and hard rock. Mm. So I don't. Maybe they weren't. I mean, they were they were grateful that they they got um, help making a record, but I don't think that's the sound they wanted for themselves. And they were always constantly bugging Mal to help them. They re they really loved Mal. They, they they kept asking him you know, constantly to help them with their um, recordings. So eventually Tony got pushed out and then they they convinced Apple to let Mal produce them. Yeah, and some of the songs that ended up on Magic Christian Music were produced by Mal. Yeah, and, um, and at the time when they were remixing that Magic Christian album, I think Mal was choosing some of the songs and I think Paul... Paul came in and helped um, Mal with some of the mixing when they when they were remixing that album, and um, Paul had his own suggestions. Like he really liked "They're Knocking Down Our Home," mm. one song he really liked because it was like you know when I'm 64 and Honey Pie. It's got that feel to it, that nostalgia. 30 John John called Lent Granny music, All right? Um, but. Uh, I think eventually, um, well, Linda, Linda was pregnant at the time with Mary, so eventually Paul had to, he couldn't complete the album, so I could, Mal finished off the album, even though Paul Paul helped him with some of the mixing, but Mal finished it off when Paul had to leave, when Linda was about to have uh, Mary. Yeah, so, so there was a chance that Paul might have produced the whole album if, if Linda wasn't pregnant? I, I think so. It's possible. He only, well, he only produced uh, the three songs. 
Um, I suppose he could have. Yeah, if Linda wasn't pregnant. Right. Interesting. I mean, you get songs like Bloodwind could have been on that album. But I, I think they just ran out of time because the movie was coming out, The Magic Christian. So everything was a, a was a mad rush to get it all done. Hmm. So they did whatever they needed to to get it all finished, you know, and then changing the name to Badfinger and you know, promoting it. Everything was done in, in a rush at the last minute. Everything we've heard about as far as the name Badfinger, to your knowledge, is true. That that um, originally with a little help from my friends was called Badfinger Boogie. I mean, you, you've heard this, I'm sure. Yeah. And, uh, and John Lennon came up with the name Pricks. <laughs> P. Yeah. I X he suggested uh, them. that that is true oh yeah that's true yeah but but one thing I I, I discovered when I was going through some of uh, the material Dan had was um that wasn't all only at the end of 1969 actually when the Ivies were first starting out with Apple Records in 1968 they wanted to drop the Ivies name when they were starting out not just at the end mm. because I found documentation that was uh, mentioning, I think it was the Mal Evans uh, material. They were coming up with names for the band in 1968 before they decided to keep the name Ivy's when they were signing to Apple. So they almost changed the name at the beginning, not, not at the end of the Ivy's period. So they almost weren't called the Ivy's on Apple records. They, mm. they just, they just never managed to come up with a good enough name. So they just kept the Ivies, you know, for, you know, the next few years until they could come up with something better. And then, and then Ron leaving the band and Joey coming in, it just made it convenient for them to use that um, chain of events. It was just convenient for them to change the name then. Mm -hmm. uh, that it was, that was the only reason they did it at that time because you know the, it was different members in the band so it was easier to have a different identity right and they always said that the DJs liked the name Badfinger they like saying the name better um they mentioned that in some of their interviews um when they were on you know touring America they, they would always say the DJs like saying Badfinger and it also when they were doing a concert the uh, you know the uh the um, MC or compare announcing the concert. <laughs> they they liked saying the name Badfinger when they introduced him. It, it 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 sounded better introducing them, you know, at a concert. I think so, definitely. Although I don't have a problem with Ivy's <laughs> myself. It's a memorable name for a band. It also suited their type of music more. Um, Badfinger. They Badfinger went to a harder rock sound. Yeah. Um, the Ivies are doing, you know, a variety of material, you know, pop tunes. They did some psychedelic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we know now from the, the the concert that Dan put out, the 1968 show, they were doing Cream songs. They were doing Jimi Hendrix songs. They were, they were covering whatever, you know, people listen to on the radio. Um, they, they did blues, John Mayle songs, you know. Yeah. And then early on, they were doing uh, James Brown, you know, material. <laughs> so they played everything. Interesting. It helps to explain the variety in their music when they put it out. So um, let's talk about the songs on the new CD. Um, and I got to tell you, overall, I am so impressed with the songs here. Because, like I said earlier, they're all worthy of having been released. And the ones that, to me, aren't completely finished could have been finished and they all could have ended up on bad finger albums really um the day begins what a great opening song you're going to find that all these songs have strong melodies pete's voice is wonderful as ever and uh you know i love the vocals on this song it's so memorable it could have been a hit record to me it's a great song to lead with the day begins yeah, it's just a it's just a shame he didn't finish writing that. It's I think it's like two verses. He he sings two verses and then he just repeats it. Mm. Um, 
there's a little instrumental section in between the two the the two sections that he repeats um that's really interesting he's playing a little part on the piano actually that when i discovered that recording the the tape was damaged there was uh I, I guess it was, I guess you call it uh, tape shedding. So you can, you could hear it. And um, thankfully, Kevin McGilligan did a great job restoring that um, when he did the remastering for us. Mm -hmm. And um, because originally I was going to just cut that part out and I, I prepared an edit of that. Um, and then thankfully Kevin uh, was able to restore it and we were able to keep that because that's a really nice little, uh, little little uh instrumental bit in between linking the two parts of a song um he plays some in interesting notes i don't, i'm not a musician but um it sounds like he's playing like uh maybe uh i don't know if it's a minor key or something but it he came up with some really interesting chord changes and and uh instrumental like he do variations on whatever he was doing it wouldn't be you know repetitive he would find some direction to take the, the music in that would make it um you know interesting to listen to he definitely had a songwriting style that was unique that really suited him and uh yeah i noticed that um in the liner notes thankfully in most cases you have years of when these demos were recorded um some of them you don't yeah which you don't really know a lot of those are, are um they're not a hundred percent definite they're they're kind of uh estimates based on other songs that were recorded with them uh on the tape reels uh, that pete had uh nothing was written down so a lot of it's based on relationship to other songs and uh when they were recorded no he never wrote dates down no, there's no specifics on anything. I mean, the only one we know of, like Take It All, for example, we know that was written as a result of the concert for Bangladesh. So we know that was in August 71. Mm -hmm. He wrote that about playing with George on Here Comes the Sun. I didn't know that. It's about, um, that song is about Joey and Kathy um, teasing Pete and giving him a hard time, you know, that and Pete was really humble. He, you know, he kind of felt a little bit guilty that he got the spotlight and the other guys didn't. So Joey and Kathy were like ribbing him, like, oh, you got to play with George. And Pete, you know, Pete's uh, feelings came out in that song. I never realized that. That brings a whole new dimension to that song. That's what the lyric, the sun will shine on you. That's a the sun will shine in you is about here comes the sun, the song. Right. That's why the reference to here comes the sun. Oh, very nice. First time learning this. See, you can learn anything here with any of the interviews that we do. But um, Day Begins, great, great way to open the CD. Yeah, great vocal. You could say that about all these songs, Tom. <laughs> it, 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 the main, exactly, but the amazing thing about Pete Ham is his demos are just not like they're like finished vocals they're like <laughs> what you would do on a professional uh, of an right. out like the recording session they're, they're, they don't sound like demos right. he really put all his effort into all these demos and, and he always liked to double track his voice also almost every dem demo i've gone through he's double tracked his voice instead except for like a few songs that you know, he was just doing a simple uh, instrument, a simple um, guitar song or something. But otherwise, he'd always double track his voice. Mm. And he would he would do it very well. Also, <laughs> if you compare his double tracking to the Beatles, in, in a lot of cases, he did a better job of double tracking than the Beatles did. Mm. He was much closer matching himself. Yeah. Uh, very, very rarely do you hear him go off go out of sync with his with himself mm. and, you know and harmonies are amazing singing is har harmonies with himself yeah <clears throat> that's part of the joy in listening to this stuff 
we are living in a time where people are appreciating demos and early versions of songs more than ever before. And there's there's something to be said about, you know, just the song itself in its barest form. You know, if the songs are strong just that way without having a full band arrangement, that tells you that the songs themselves are so strong. And there's also an intimacy when it's just one person and a guitar or one person and a piano. And in most cases, you know, Pete's playing everything here. So there's a real appeal to that, you know, and it, part of the joy is knowing that Pete had so much potential and there's so many songs that he recorded that could have come out. And now thankfully they're gradually coming out through people like you. But at the same time, you know, it's frustrating because these could have been on Badfinger albums. These could have come out. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can't it, imagine the other guys saying no to some of these songs here. He had so much material, there wasn't enough time to get them all out. Yeah. It was, it was a good good problem to have. Yeah. Um, the song Let the Sun Shine Through is another one that I think was really strong. That's yeah, that's one of my favorites. Um, there's an electric keyboard on there which sounds more like a harpsichord. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not I'm still not sure what that is. Uh somebody suggested it might be a clavichord, but I'm not sure. I'd have to find a musician that's familiar with that instrument. Uh oh. I don't know how many different sounds that instrument can make. Um I'm still trying to find out about that one. Yeah. Uh, it could also be an organ. I don't think it's, it could be an organ. Um, I looked up clavichord and said it was some kind of uh, similar to a uh, harpsichord, but it's, I don't know. I think it can make a lot of different sounds, but hmm. uh, yeah, I, I'd like to get somebody else, somebody's input. If, if there's anybody out there that knows anything about a clavichord, it'd be interesting to hear if, that's what they think he's playing in that song. And also um, Scarlet Willow, he's also playing it on that song. That's another one. Very pretty tune. Nice keyboard work, cymbals being played on there. Yeah, a little bit of uh, backward cymbals. Are they? <laughs> another Beatle influence. <laughs> There's a lot of Beatle influences in his demos. Backwards guitar, backwards cymbals. and. <laughs> There's so much Beatles influence in Badfinger, you know, and it it's pretty obvious, but, you know, they still had their own identity. But do you sometimes think of Badfinger in a way like, you know, Pete was the Paul in the band and Tommy was the John and Joey was the George and Mike was the Ringo? I try, but it, it doesn't really fit. <laughs> I mean, Pete is, I mean, Tommy is more the Paul because he can, you know, do the screaming. Um I don't know. Pete doesn't really match to anybody. George and John, like, I don't, I don't know. Just, I don't know if it could be the John Lennon. It's just with Joey being the lead guitarist in the beginning, not getting as many songs as. I, I would compare Joey more to John Lennon. I guess Pete is more like George Harrison. Uh, that that's the cl closest comparison I I would make. I don't know. I think there are times when when Pete's voice is so ballsy, you know, it's very much like Paul and he's got such a strong pop element to him. Pete has a really melodic voice. He's not a great screamer like Tommy, but he could still hit some pretty high notes. Hmm. I don't know. That's that's the uh, comparisons that I make. That's what I hear in the music. Everyone could be different, you know. No, you you have a good point about Tommy though with the high voice. Yeah, yeah. once once I get more of a Tommy demos out, people will hear his voice is just amazing. Mm. It's a lot like Paul. All right, uh, more, more songs like Rock of All Ages. <laughs> so, that's a great rock song. That type of singing, he can do that mm. with no uh -huh. effort, just like Paul with singing "Long Tall Sally." Yeah, no, I agree. Love Will Be is a real nice ballad from three, four time. Um, mainly guitar playing on there, recorded in 1972. That's another one <laughs> that could have worked on a Bad Finger album. I really like the the lyrical message. This is fantastic. It's 
reminiscent of the word by the Beatles or all you need is love. I think it's got the same kind of message. Yeah. Okay. I'm only human. That's another catchy song. It's, it's surprising to me how much is in here from the second half of the sixties, you know, and, uh, this one's from 1969, at least according to your records. Um, very catchy song, good chorus. It's so similar to a lot of the other stuff that Badfinger put out that Pete wrote to me. It could have yeah. been magic Christian music. Yeah, I'm Only Human definitely could have been a Badfinger song. It was uh, you know, a four-piece arrangement. Mm -hmm. It could have, been, could have been a pretty good rock song in one of their albums. No, I'm thinking like it's similar to the sound of like a crimson ship or something like that. It could have fit on no dice. Yeah, that one too. Definitely. I think anyone listening to this CD is going to pick up on this. Happy Song, you said it was recorded in 1966 with Ron Griffiths on bass. Yeah, it was either fall of 66 or early 67. Um... There's no way to know for sure. And so they started doing demos when they moved to London and that was July of 66. So everything was after July of 66. So they never worked on this in the Ivies. No, that is the Ivies. Oh, okay. Cause it's just, I thought it was just Pete and Ron. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I, I thought you meant something else. Yeah. Yeah. It's just Pete, just Pete and Ron on that one. Yeah. But the Ivies, yeah, the Ivies start, uh, started in 1964 so all of these songs would have been written for the ivies but did they ever attempt to do this no 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 none of these songs like like i said before the they had so much material that there's no time to record it all and the the, the trends in music changed so quickly in the late 60s that by the time you wrote these songs they were outdated already that was, that was another problem they had between the ivies and badfinger they were so prolific, you know, yeah. and that they is had so much time to write. Yeah, because uh, they weren't touring America yet. They were they were pretty much in their home area. They just were in the UK, so they had more time to write songs. And once they started going to America, they had a lot less time to write. They had to write in hotel rooms and you know whatever um, traveling. It was much harder to write songs. Mm hmm. And like you said before, I miss you is on here. This is from 1967. So it tells you how far back the song goes. Yeah, that's that's the uh, first demo. Yep. And, uh, you know, real nice ballad from the band when they eventually released it. Although I never really saw it as a single myself, but no, I never did either. I, uh did a lot of research with Dan trying to figure out why that was released as a single and we could never find anybody that could give us a straight answer. We, we don't know who's responsible for that um, to this day. Um, <laughs> it seems obvious that Shine On would have been a better single, but it, I the only explanation we have is that um, Pete Ham wanted it. Uh, he put it out as a message to his uh, girlfriend, Beverly, who moved away and got married in Africa. But that doesn't make sense either. Well, I know he put it on the album for that reason. But as far as putting it on the 45 uh, as the first single, or the, no, actually it was the second single, because they put out Love is Easy in the UK. But um, even, even the band didn't even know why they put it out as a single. So... That, that tells me that Pete didn't push it. Somebody at the record company, one, one of the theories Dan and I had uh, that we heard about was somebody somewhere in, in the record company or thought it might be, um, might have the potential to be another without you. That That's the only theory that, that makes any sense. They thought maybe, oh, this could be the next without you, like a big, huge, uh, success, I don't know, if somebody else could do a version of it, or I don't know if they were going to expect Badfinger to, to have a hit with it, but 
but that that was the theory that it, it might it might be the had the potential to be the next without you and be a really huge song yeah no i definitely think shine on would have been a big hit could have been it when you this is your debut album on warner brothers you want to make sure the right singles are picked and and uh warner brothers didn't even follow up with uh uh, most fans think Lonely You would have been a great single, follow-up single. Mm. But uh, Werner's didn't do a poor job of promoting the band. That's a shame. When when um, Wish You Were Here came out, was um, No One Knows a single? Only in Japan. <laughs> what a great song. I mean, that should have been a hit, as far as I'm concerned. And, um Dan found out in the vault in uh, California, um, Warner Brothers, they had a uh, test copy of Just a Chance that was supposed to be the single in America. Yeah. I don't get it. I really wish both those albums, especially Wish You Were Here, which is so great, should have done much better. Yeah, Chris Thomas did a did a lot of work on that album and he was really disappointed so all right um you got a real short track in there with pete's boogie you threw that in there it's only like 30 yeah. seconds long yeah, pm did a lot of instrumentals like that um short pieces are interesting dance put out quite a few of those already mm -hmm. it's nice i just wish that he did that for a couple of minutes <laughs> you know yeah but it shows his, his strong piano playing there. Yeah, he seems to be influenced a lot by uh, Fats Domino. I hear that a lot in his, his piano playing. Hmm. A lot of boogie-woogie style he, he liked. That's probably very accurate. Have to think about that now. <laughs> Little Mary is a real nice song from 1969 um a bit melancholy you know it's it's a finished song it's a lot of lyric he wrote a lot of verses to that it seemed like uh it reminds me a lot of she's leaving home by the beatles um a sad really sad song about a girl who was like a loner and she ran away from home and then and then she got involved with a with a guy and then got pregnant and then he left her and then and then the her baby grew up and then the baby left her it's re really sad <laughs> really sad song i don't know why i don't know where p came up with the idea for that it's, it's uh unless it's just made up a story i, I don't know where where he came up with that idea hmm. there's no telling where i mean she's leaving home could have been an influence in a way but I understand the, you know, similarity there. But it's it's really nice. Nice use of the organ throughout the song. Um and he plays drums on it, which is interesting. It's one of the rare demos he plays drums himself. Mm. Even though it's really rudimentary. It's just just to accent different parts of the song. Right. There's take it all on here. Um this version you said was previously issued on without you uh, yeah the book yeah second edition of the book on cd it's nice to hear this just um just pete and the electric piano um and the lyrics weren't finished yet yeah yes i i don't know if there was a more finished demo that's the only one that survived okay so this was done very close to the time of Straight Up? Yeah, right after Cons for Bangladesh. Um, right before it, they were you right were right before they were starting to record with Todd Rundgren. Yeah. What are your feelings about the whole George Harrison, Todd Rundgren situation there? I mean, George had to leave because he was busy working on the concert. So Todd took over. And I know years ago, Joey Mullen said to me that he wasn't crazy about Todd's production. In recent years, he seems to have changed his tune. I really like Todd's production. He 
he really saved the drum sound. Um, the main changes he did was re redoing Mike Mike uh, Gibbons drum uh, drum parts. Hmm. He had a really punchy sound. Uh, George's drum sound was very weak. Um, uh, I have some of the uh, rough mixes, copies of those, and you can barely hear Mike's drums. Todd really gave it a punchy. I mean, his snare drums really, they really jump out at you. They, they really, uh, straight up really, um, really showcases Mike's uh, drum drumming ability. He's just an excellent drummer. Mm -hmm. I think he's way underrated as a drummer. He, he was... He was uh, influenced a lot by progressive rock, so some of that influenced him. I know that I did ask Todd, I think for you, actually, on your behalf, because you wanted to know if if uh, Todd had anything to do with changing the guitar solo or anything in day after day. And he said he didn't think so, but if anything, he would have changed the drum sound. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm still not sure about the guitar, but definitely the drum sound, yeah. Because hmm. Joey has always said that the lead guitar is a combination of George and Pete. Yeah, there's no way to know if Todd, if Todd changed any of it. Um, hmm. We'll never know that for sure. Well, when I asked him, he didn't he didn't remember changing that at all. So, but it certainly sounds like a George Harrison slide guitar, but. Yeah, Pete Am could also play really good slide guitar. He played a lot of it in in, in concert with the group. Yep. Think It Over is another song that I'm really impressed with. Very catchy. To me, it had hit potential. It's a, like a bluesy rocker. Um, the piano works so nicely with it. Kind of reminds me of some of John's demos. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Yeah. The way that he plays the piano and plays simple chords and does, I think, their eighth notes on there. Kind of like she is a friend of Dorothy's. If yeah, you... it sounds a lot, a lot like it's Dakota, some of his Dakota demos. Yeah. But um, I could definitely hear Badfinger developing that song and rocking out a bit with that one. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Pete plays a nice lead guitar on that demo. <clears throat> yeah, so it worked. All these songs, I think, Pete's fans will be impressed with. We mentioned Scarlet Willow. There's Blood went on here, and Pete plays acoustic and electric guitars. Double track the vocals. <clears throat> Such a strong song. Yeah, the Ivy's version of Blood will come out eventually. That's that's really interesting. That Ivy's version has Ron singing harmony vocals on there. So. Is it pretty much exactly the same arrangement? Pretty close, yeah. It's just not quite as polished. <clears throat> yeah, it's just nice to hear. I mean, there you have the country style, the bad finger. So that adds another dimension to them that how versatile. Yeah. They are. Yeah, Mike Mike Gibbons did a song Cowboy that was country. With the right. fiddle. Yeah. That was on an ass. Right. Okay. Okay. Stick a line in is interesting for Beatle fans because and John Lennon's last name is in the lyrics. Yeah, I, I couldn't think of anything else he would be saying there. It's just um I still don't really understand uh what he's trying to say in that song, other than some kind of social commentary. Um, sort of reminds me of Piggies in a way, the lyrics, like there's stuffy shirts, that kind of, that lyric. Okay. Yeah. Um, and all this stuff, by the way, if you want to listen to it, these songs you can listen to on YouTube. And I'm sure it's all on Spotify too. Yeah, Spotify, Amazon. Yep. But uh, Pete is singing, stick a line in for Lennon, stick a line in for me. Stick a line in for everyone if you want to come to tea. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as soon as I heard it, I said, is he singing about John there? So yeah, I was trying to make a connection like with with uh, the time period, but it was 
a little bit earlier, I thought maybe it would be um, referencing the Lennon Remembers interview, but I think it was recorded in early 1970s, so that, that didn't make sense. So It could have been for anything. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Unless it was referencing, uh, you know, something John did on the White Album, or I don't know. I, so <laughs> it's a mystery what that one's about. Okay, something on my mind. Very catchy tune again, Pete on piano. This is from 1968, apparently. Sounds like a McCartney song to me. It's got sort of like a standard feel to it. Old-fashioned type of song. <clears throat> um, there's also I Can Be. That's a 1967 demo. Another strong ballad. Lots of potential. You wrote in here that it was previously available in edited form, mistitled as It Takes So Long from the 1995 bootleg CD, Someday Will Be Known. Yeah, that came off of a tape Mike Gibbons had um, of some of their demos. Uh, he gave copies to fans. Hmm. Okay. So there's all these different sources then. Yeah. So some came from Mike. Oh, that just that and the ending actually was uh on on the uh tapes that dan had um the recording was longer but the ending was missing so i had to use the um the copy that came from mike's tape for the ending you can actually it's single tracked i think i think most of the demos double tracked um yeah the ending was missing for some reason i don't know why it maybe got uh raced over on on the original demo I, I don't know what happened with that one it's uh you know it's a great thing if you can piece it all together somehow there are some heartbreaking moments in some of the tapes that dan had like uh like tommy's demo for i can't live that got half of that got erased over when uh joey was recording his demos for no dice he was doing some demos for um it was better days or love you do one of those hmm. they actually recorded over some of the without you demos he was reusing the tape <laughs> so some of the stuff got erased over well that's what you'll find happening with a lot of recordings from a lot of these artists who at the time were certainly not going to think about any historical value that these recordings have um walk out in the rain is in there i've always liked that song from Magic Christian Music. That was a big surprise to me. I, I was surprised that he did that on piano. I never expected to hear that. I thought it was just going to be an acoustic guitar demo. But I'm glad he changed it. I really like the the arrangement on Magic Christian Music. Like you said, these are just, they're good enough to come out the way they were. And the vocals are just, you get the feeling that they're like one take. Are, in most of these cases, are there several takes of each song? That you uh, have to go through and pick the best one, or they're just you know a few. Um, uh, sometimes, like um, the day begins. There was a whole reel of him practicing that song, hey. you know, on the piano, trying to get it just right. Um, and some other songs, there's like two or three takes. Uh, I can't take it. He did several takes of that, um, and uh, some other ones, but. Most of the multiple takes um, probably got erased. There's <clears throat> very few examples of that. Hmm. That's sad, but that happens a lot. Um, there's a couple more songs left. Stop Waiting for the Sun to Shine. This is a 1967 demo with an amplified acoustic guitar. Up-tempo song, catchy, a little too short. <laughs> yeah, that one's too short. That's... That's a nice one. That's uh, I like the lyrics to that one. It's uh, it's it's about telling people to if you want something done, do it yourself. Don't wait for somebody else to help you. Mm -hmm. Help yourself, kind of song. I, I like the message to that one. Right. Yeah. And there's Tulip, which is the last song there. That's from 1968. Pete's on electric guitars for that. Another song with tremendous potential, very up tempo tune. Anything you know about that? Uh, that was originally 
Dan originally was going to put that on Seven Park Avenue, but I don't know why he didn't include it. Um, I have no clue. <laughs> I just found that in some documentation, he had like a rough, he had a rough mix of the Seven Park Avenue album I found, and Tulip was in that bunch of mixes. So um, he had it in a list of potential songs for that first Pete Ham album. Um, but that's a great song. That's that's one of my favorites. It's uh, I just don't know. <laughs> the title is kind of strange. I I guess uh, the girl is girl is called Tulip. I I don't know. The title is kind of strange to me. Uh, you can also play with the word tulip as if it's you know two lips. <laughs> that's how my mind works anyway. Yeah, I never thought of that. But um. It's just amazing how many songs he's written and recorded that most of us don't even know about unless we really want to take the time to study. And thankfully, like I said, you're working on putting out a lot of this material. Tell us about some of the other recent releases that have come out on Badfinger and Pete, because you mentioned some of them already. I have this one right here, the Ibis, Golden Delicious Demos. Yeah, that's the the last project Dan did on the Ivies, uh, and uh, I have three more CDs planned to follow that one. So, so it's a lot of Ivies material. Yeah. So this, it, does anyone like you mentioned Pete's brother? Does he know the origin of some of these songs? The songs that are on here or anything that you've released through all no. the other ones. Not really? No, there's no record spoken. of anything. Have you spoken much to him? Um, Pete's brother? Yeah. Oh no, because he was he was ill um <clears throat> back in uh, 2013. He passed away like 10 years ago. And what about Pete's wife? Uh oh, Anne? Yeah. Um, she only knows like the later material. Um, she wasn't around during the Ivies. Um, yeah, she was very, very little. She doesn't um, know too much about how the songs were written. Oh, okay. Dan, Dan does know some of the later songs that were about her. Like it doesn't really matter. Some of the later songs he wrote are about her. Mm -hmm. um, or just how lucky we are is another one. Yeah, this would be nice if there was someone close to Pete that could shed some light about some of these songs. I mean, the most important thing is that we have them, you know, mm. to appreciate now. Uh, Beverly is the one person that knows the most because she was around when Pete wrote all the songs with the Ivies. Okay. Was she able to tell you about any of the early songs here from the 60s? Um, no, I haven't tried asking her. Okay. I've never spoken to her personally. Um, so. All right. So, you know, would be nice maybe if you want to investigate doing that into the future so we know a little bit more about these songs. I know your plate's kind of full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But everything else. But, um, you know, just to have some background on some of these songs. But uh, having the audio is the most important thing still. Anyway. Any of the other uh, albums you want to talk about that you might have there in front of you? Uh, this one, the Demos Variety Pack. Um, that was the last Pete Ham release that Dan worked on. Um, it's got 23 tracks on it. That's still still for sale. And are they, do they spread, you know, all the different years or are they close to a certain yeah, period. it spreads all the years. It has uh, no matter what is on there and perfection and <clears throat> um, some of the newer tracks are Mosey and um, what's the other ones? Uh, You're such a good woman. Um, things are really getting tight. Some of the those are some of the newer tracks. Take me back. Mm hmm. Yeah, just looking at this one, 
which I need to listen to again. It's been a while since I heard it, but there's demos here of Without You on here, as well as Carry On Till Tomorrow, Midnight Sun. There you go. Midnight Sun is another one I was thinking of. Yeah, that's that's a good one because that is Ron Griffith singing. He was supposed to be the vocalist on that. Hmm. Um, he came down with the chicken pox. That's why the Ivy's version has um, Pete Ham singing. Ron was sick. That's interesting. Ron's famous quote from that is, uh, I know, Pete's famous quote from that to Ron when he went back to tell Ron what happened, he said, uh, I murdered it, murdered it, mush. That was the famous quote, but with an expletive in there um, included. <laughs> uh, did a damn good job on that song. Yeah, still. It's, uh, I still think Ron Ron's is better. Hmm. Okay, well. All right. So any projects that you're working on now now what's what's the next one that you're next gonna... one's gonna be an ivy's release um trying to target that for june release okay any hint as to what might be on there as a little teaser um yeah some there's some songs that no one no one's even heard of mm -hmm. that i didn't even know about until i i discovered that their files um so yeah um, it's gonna be a lot of surprises on that one and you pack a lot of songs on these cds i noticed like this one right here has got 20 yeah 20 songs got 18 on the new pete ham one so yeah you give a lot of value in in these releases here um Is there any chance, since we mentioned them before, that um, Y and T might reissue the earlier stuff? Uh, it's a possibility. Um, I, mean, I think that you know, word has to get out there. There may be a lot of fans who are discovering Badfinger now, older fans that don't even know this stuff is out. So it's just a matter of really plugging it and publicizing it. So it's a possibility. You might might put misunderstood out on CD. If there's demand for it. Okay. Um, All right. So at some point, I think we'll talk about Misunderstood and some of these other CDs and Badfinger albums. And uh, hopefully soon, like I was saying at the beginning of the show, I'd like to just do a show on the Badfinger and Beatle connections. You know, the concert for Bangladesh, the Imagine album, Paul working with the band, George working on Straight Up all of that you know that's another thing i was when i was talking about um todd rundgren working on straight up he has said a number of times that as much as he liked working with george harrison he was really upset that you know day after day is credited as being produced by george harrison when it should have said george harrison and todd rundgren yeah i agree yeah he should have gotten more credit than he did yeah, so There's a lot of a lot of the sound of that album is due to his work, right? No, I love it. Maybe at some point we'll ask what's the best of all the Badfinger albums, and I'd love to get your take on that. So uh, I have a feeling I know what it is, having spoken to you about it in the past. Always but, changing. Uh, what's that? I'm always changing my mind. Okay, well that's good my favorite album <laughs> all right tom well thanks so much we're going to provide in the description box the amazon link for pete ham for the new one gwent gardens also uh make sure that you check out the website badfinger library find out all things about badfinger um including if you want to know all the lyrics of all the songs on great gardens you can go there for that and uh, everything about their history can be found on the website. And uh, Tom's always updating it. So thank you so much for spending time with us. And uh, by all means, pick up the Pete Ham CD.
Gwent Gardens. So it's available digitally and on CD. And there's no plans for vinyl, right? Um, not at the moment, no. Okay. But uh, I I know you're going to enjoy it. If you're a Badfinger fan and you love Pete's music, you're going to love Gwent Gardens. Thanks so much to everyone for watching. Thank you, Tom, for being with us. Hope to have you back soon. Yep. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks to all of you for watching, and we'll see you next time.